chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. That's 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. And Noah and Kalani are going to read. Thank you, boys. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. Happy Sabbath. Um, as I said before, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very good and very nice to be back home. And also it's a privilege to be able to be standing here in, in, in a Sabbath day, in a holy day of the Lord. And also understanding that this is the house of the Lord. And therefore he is right now with us here with his holy angels and then this place becomes a holy place where we worship the lord let's pray before we open the bible heavenly father lord there is a message for your church today and lord you have entrusted me to come and share this message with your people here in wulara it is not my message i'm still trying to find different ways lord in order to live according to your word but if the message that you have um, put in my heart to share with your church today is your message father i'm asking you to lead me and maybe your words and not my words i'm praying this father in the beautiful name of jesus amen, amen. so the verse that the boys have read is found as you know in the book of timothy the second book of Timothy, chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. And I'll be using that particular, those particular verses as the core verses for the whole sermon of today that is entitled Heaven Mode. As, as you know, when you go, uh, when, when you fly, usually they ask you to put your phone on flight mode so it doesn't interrupt with the navigation system of the planes. Um, so the fly can be safely when the, fly, when the plane takes off and also when the plane lands. But today I thought about heaven mode. So rather than putting on flight mode, we are invited by the word of God that every believer should, should tune our lives into a heaven mode. And let's see what Paul says here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. And it says... Paul says, I have fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Finally, he says, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Notice that Paul is introducing in here this concept of a crown that is going to be given to people who, like Paul, Fight the good fight, finish the race, and keep the faith. And now Paul is keeps, keeps saying, the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. What, what word, words of assurance from the Apostle Paul in saying, I've done everything I could possibly done to keep the faith and fight with my Lord whatever battles he faced in his life. And then he says, I believe now by the grace and the mercy of God that there is a crown of righteousness available for me on the day the Lord will come back to this earth to take me to be with him forever. But the last part of this verse is what I'm going to be focusing on today. He says, and not to me only, Notice that Paul now is including more people 
in this reward of getting that crown of righteousness. He says, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Notice that the condition in here, in order for us to get the crown of righteousness, is that if we love the appearing, if we love the second coming of our Lord. And now the question in here is, how many of us love the second coming of the Lord? And probably the second question is, how does we love the second coming of Jesus? How do we understand those words? As you know, I went to South America recently, went back home to visit my family in Peru, and I took Celita with me, obviously, and my wife. Celita had been there before, but Celita never been to Peru, never been to the little town where I was born, in the jungle area of Peru. I should say tropical, because when I say jungle, people think about the jungle with these lions and, 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 you know, all these kind of animals there. It is the jungle, but the city is there, right? There's no, there's no tigers or anything like that, probably in the zoo might be, but there's monkeys and there's snakes and all of this, all right, if you like those animals. So we purchased the ticket beforehand. A few months before I was able to be in the plane to go to Peru, I was already living, I was already dreaming and longing to be in Peru. I was in Sydney, but I was already eating the food that my mom would prepare in my town. I was in Sydney, but I was already swimming in the rivers of my little town. I was in Sydney, but I was already eating all the exotic food fruits that we have in the jungle. You see, I was longing. I was still in Sydney, but my mind, but my thought, but my heart was already over there in Peru. I was thinking about taking Celita to walk through the park that I used to walk when I was little. I was dreaming to take Celita to the school that I used to go when I used to live there. I was dreaming to be sitting next to my grandma's bed because I knew she was sick and I wanted to have a conversation with her. I know she has dementia, but I, I was longing that if I get time, spend time with her, she could at least remember me, at least for one or two seconds and it happened. It was a beautiful experience there. Long before I was able to land in my little town, I was already living that experience. In other words, in the words of Paul in the book of Timothy, I loved my experience in Peru already before I was able to be there. So this is the idea in those verses. Paul is saying that we as believers are invited today to love to long, to dream, to want to be in heaven, to dream to see our Lord face to face, to love his second coming, to love his appearing. And then the question comes back again, do we really love the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ? Are we really longing for that? And how does we love the second coming of Jesus? Notice that Paul will elaborate about this idea of loving the second coming of Jesus. He will give us more clues and he will elaborate that whole idea in the next verses. Let's open with me your Bibles in Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. And I understand that everybody has a Bible. So, since everybody has a Bible, let's open our Bibles, because today we're going to be opening our Bibles many times and going through different verses. So, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, says, For our conversation is in heaven. Now, we'll stop there for a second, because the version that I'm reading right now in Philippians is King James Version. And I understand that many of you might have New King James or NIV 
or many other versions and New King James and the rest of the other versions usually say there in Philippians 3.20, it says, for our citizenship is in heaven. However, let me, let me point this out to you. King James, the old King James says, for our conversation is in heaven. I was trying to understand how can I, you know, conciliate or understand these two different words in translation in here. Citizenship and the other word is conversation. Obviously, for the purpose of the sermon, conversation seems to fit perfectly in the idea of loving the second coming of the Lord. Because Paul is directly here in Philippians 3.20 saying that our conversation should be in heaven. In other words, when we come to church, and I'm not talking about when you are in your workplace or in your house, well, at least when we come to church, what do we talk about in church? What is our conversation about when we gather together as believers? Well, Paul, he says, if we love the second coming of the Lord, if we really want to see Jesus, if we really long to be in heaven, then our conversation should be about heaven. It does, doesn't make sense. Very easy to understand. Now, how then, New King James says, that for our citizenship is in heaven. Well, we see it from this perspective. A citizenship is, is, is a sense of belonging, right? I belong to a particular country. I, I have an Australian passport, and therefore I'm an Australian citizen because I belong to this country, my identity or, or familiar with this country, then when the Bible says that our citizenship is in heaven, it's telling us that we belong to heaven. See, we do not belong to Australia, or we do not belong to Peru or South America or China or any other country, but spiritually, by the grace of God, all believers who truly believe in Jesus and follow Jesus, belong to heaven and our citizenship is up there in the kingdom of heaven we live on this earth in this kingdom of darkness but we do not belong to this kingdom we belong to the kingdom of heaven and because we belong to the kingdom of heaven and then we talk about this kingdom every day because we haven't been there yet physically but we want to be there, right? So because we want to be there, and then Paul is saying, we should be talking about that then. We should be reflecting upon that. Our conversation should be about heaven, should be about Jesus, should be about his salvation, his grace, and his love for all of us. Because the more we talk about Jesus, the more we shall reflect his divine image. Let me say that again. The more we talk about Jesus, the more we shall reflect his divine image. The more we talk about heaven, the more we develop in us the desire to be in heaven. But if we... But if we spend our time talking about earthly things, our heart and minds would be set and fixed on this world. But the Bible is clear when it says that we do not belong to this kingdom, but we belong to heaven, and therefore we should talk about that all the time. And this is how we love the second coming of the Lord. So Philippians 3.20 says in the last part of this verse, from whence also we look, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So my brothers and sisters, the Bible is inviting all of us, members of this church, visitors, whoever have come today to church, whoever believes in Jesus, the invitation is that we should spend time in the church specifically, especially, and outside the church, spend time talking about heaven. And as we do that, as we talk about heaven, as we dream about, as we talk about Jesus, 
will be reflecting his divine character in us day by day and Sabbath by Sabbath. I was praying in this morning and I was telling the Lord, Lord, I've written the sermon. Is there anything else should I add? And I had this conviction in me. And I'll say this with a lot of respect in love because I belong to this church. And I myself are guilty of some of the things that as a church, I believe we haven't been doing properly. I'm the, I've been the head elder for the last two years. I've been in this church since 2012 or 13, I think. But I notice in here that we have a lot to improve in one particular aspect. Especially when Paul says that we should talk about heaven in Jesus. Somehow our conversation in church has not been about heaven or Jesus. It has been about any other thing, but not Jesus or heaven or his salvation. Let me take you to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 20. And I'm telling, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know that I, I'm going to share this with you with a lot of respect and, and love because I'm also guilty of all these things that I haven't done in our church. Habakkuk 2.20 says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Who is in his holy temple? The Lord. So this is the holy temple, isn't it? This is the house of the Lord. Therefore, Habakkuk called call this holy. And if this is holy, therefore we should treat this place as holy because the Lord is here. And Habakkuk says the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And a comment upon this verse says, True reverence for God is inspired by a sense of his infinite greatness and a realization of his presence. Why this place is holy? Because the Lord is here. With this sense of the unseen, our heart should be deeply impressed. And the hour and place of prayer which is the church as sacred only because God is here. If God wouldn't be here, then this place would be a common place of gathering. And then we can do whatever we want here and we can talk whatever we want to talk about. But because this is the house of the Lord and he is here with us, therefore this place becomes holy in everything is about the Holy God that we have. This is why the church should be invested with a sacred reverence. It should not be made a place to meet old friends and visit and introduce common thoughts and worldly business transactions. This should be left outside the church. In other words, we have something to share here that is not related to the Holy God that we have and his precious salvation because he has given his precious blood for your redemption and my redemption. And if we are before him, we cannot see him physically, but if he's here, but we have something that we want to share with our brothers and sisters, and it's nothing to do with our holy God. The invitation is that we can go outside and talk about it and then come inside because this is the holy temple of the Lord. So when we, the worshipers, enter the place of meeting, enter the church, we should do so with modesty, passing quietly to our seats. And if we have to wait a few minutes before the meeting begins, let us maintain a true spirit of devotion by silent meditation, keeping the heart uplifted to God in prayer that the service may be of 
a special benefit to our own hearts and lead to the conviction and conversion of other souls. As we read that, my invitation as a member of this church, not as an elder or as a minister, but as a member, my invitation is that we reflect upon those words and see if we, as believers, who love the second coming of the Lord, who wants to see the Lord, are reflecting this in our church. If it is not, then let the Holy Spirit help us and teach us how we should live and act when we come to meet the Lord in His house. Then when we leave the church at the end of the service, let us all exit the church without crowding or loud talking, feeling that we are in the presence of God. Let there be no stopping in the aisles to visit or to gossip. gossip. If you want to read more about that, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 491 to 496. I was impressed in the morning as I said to share this with you because I myself am not believing, being living according to that. And today we can ask the Lord to forgive us and to help us to conduct ourselves in His house in the way He wants us to conduct ourselves. Because if we are, if we are to go to heaven to live in the presence of a holy God, we need to start learning how to live in the presence of the Holy God here before we get up there. One thing is important. The Bible says that when Jesus comes, this body that is mortal will become immortal. Notice that when Jesus comes, there is a transformation in the humans. But that transformation is a physical transformation. In other words, when Jesus comes... We're no longer going to age. Praise the Lord for that. How many amens can I hear? <laughs> We're going to be young forever. No more headaches, no more pain, no more suffering, none of this. No more nursing homes, no more assignments, none. Physically perfect and healthy. Praise the Lord for that. However, our char characters will not be changed when Jesus comes. These are going to be changed in our earthly experience with the Lord. And if we do not learn how to live and how to relate to a holy God in his holy house, I don't think we can expect to learn when we go to heaven. Probably it would be a little bit uncomfortable because we want to do things that we used to do here, but and then up here we won't be able to do that and then it's not going to be easy for us. Probably we'll not be able to make it to heaven either. So therefore Paul in Philippians 3.20 says that my conversation, your conversation, if we really love the second coming of the Lord should be about heaven, about Jesus, about his salvation. Not only in the church, it's important in the house of the Lord, but we remember, remember that when we leave this place, we're still walking outside as sons and daughters of God. And we should reflect that outside as well. But the Apostle Paul now tells us in the book of Corinthians, chapter 2. First book of Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 9. First Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 9. He adds something more in the conversation about heaven. He says, But... It is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of men. What? The things which God has prepared for those who love him. Isn't that similar to what he said at the end of 2 Timothy 4.8? That the crown of righteousness is, is, is going to be given to everybody who love his appearing, love his second coming. Now he says, in, in heaven, he says, 
no eyes, no, no ease, no human being can, can be able to imagine or understand how heaven would look like. So much as we try, but we are invited and encouraged today to talk about heaven, to dream about it, even though, as Paul says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor having entered into the heart of men. Those are the things that the Lord is preparing for you and for me. My brothers, when we think about that, when we dream about it, you notice how the whole way of thinking will change. And if we are going through some sort of trials and tribulations at the moment, you'll be able to notice that when we compare what we're going through now in this earth, when we compare this to the glory of the Lord, when we'll be able to see him and live with him forever in heaven, and then the little issues that we have in, in earth is insignificant in comparison to the beautiful place that the Lord is preparing for us, that nobody can actually understand or even even imagine how heaven would look like but even though we might not be able to to do that paul invites us to talk about it to dream about it second corinthians chapter 4 verses 16 to 18 now see what paul is adding now more into this heaven conversation Therefore, says Paul in here, we do not lose heart. Why is Paul saying that? Because the message of the second coming of Jesus has been preached for generations. I went back to my little church in, the, in my town in Peru, and I was able to see the old fellows who used to be young back in the days, who used to preach about the second coming of Jesus. They're now sitting at the back of the church. They can't do much anymore. They age a lot. But they keep telling me, remember, boy, that the Lord is coming. It's a reminder that the Lord is coming. But sometimes we lose heart in the second coming of the Lord. Because so many things going on in the world. Because we've been hearing this, this message for years and the Lord is not here yet. We're still here. Why are we still here? Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Do not get discouraged, in other words. And then he's saying, even though our, out, our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Even though our physical bodies are decaying every day, even though we're getting old every day, we can't stop that. But our inward man can be renewed day by day. And the best way to do that is by talking about Jesus, about heaven, about the salvation all the time. By, by just dedicating time upon time to dream about heaven and the second coming of the Lord. And this is how our inward man will be renewed day by day. And our hope never will grow old, but will be renewed day by day. Verse 17, there in 2 Corinthians 4, it says, For our light affliction, notice Paul is called it just light affliction. And remember, Paul went through jail, been beaten, rejected, so many things. How many of us have been in jail? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> I've been there every day. I go there every day. How many of us have been beaten? How many of us have been rejected and, and, and ridiculed and criticized and all these things? Probably some of us. But I don't think any of us here in this church has gone through what Paul has been through. And then he calls that light affliction. That's a small. Why he's able to do that? Because he is not focusing on what is in this world, but he is dreaming about heaven. He's thinking about the day the Lord will come and take him to give to him the crown of righteousness and tell him, Paul, there you go. This is your room. This is your house. This is the place I prepare for you. When we think about that and then whatever afflictions we have on this earth is light. And then what else Paul says, which is but for a moment. 
is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So my brothers, we walk on this earth longing, dreaming and wanting to be in heaven. It's things that we haven't seen yet, but it's in our hearts and minds that keeps us occupied in this, that helps us to be renewed day by day. And then when we come to worship the Lord, we remember that this is his house and we should respect and show reverence to the king of this universe when we come to worship him. Because the same reverence that we show to him here in his house on this earth would be the same that will be showing him up there in heaven. So we need to start here. Now, let me give you an example of how we can dream about heaven. How we can talk about something we haven't even imagined. Nobody has been in heaven. Nobody knows. So how we can engage into that conversation? Well, John in Revelation helps us a little bit. John, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. See what John says in here. And, and you know, I wish I could be John. He saw heaven. He saw heaven and earth. He, he, he saw envisioned so many things. And this in here, says in here, Revelation 21, 1. This is an example of how we can engage in conversation about heaven. Revelation 21, 1 says, Now I saw, says John, new heaven, a new heaven, a, a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And pay attention to the last part of this verse. Also, there was no more. How many of us like the beach? Alan, I know you love the beach, man. But the Bible see us says that in the new heaven and the new earth, there's no more sea, no more ocean. You don't want to go, right? Say, no, I'm not going to go there. There's no beach. What are we going to do? I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm happy with the creek and the river and the mountains. But not everybody is like me. Some of you enjoy the beaches. Well, you grew up here. You were born here. This is Australia. You like the beach, you, right? But the Bible here says that John saw new heaven and new earth, but he did not see the sea. Now, this is how we can start talking about heaven, you see? See, when we just read that and say, wow, so how then, what? And then you just talk about that, and before you know, you'll be talking about heaven, talking about Jesus already, rather than be talking about work, business, this movie, the other movie, this game, the other game, this new TV program, or whatever it is. Because we don't understand what, what Paul, John is trying to say here, but we can dream about it together. We can talk and we can say, well, you know, maybe, maybe, yes, maybe, no. How would that be? But John gives us more information about this sea. Revelation 4, 6 now. Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. It says, Revelation 4, 6. Before the throne, and John saw the vision in there. He said, before the throne was a, what did he see? A sea of glass. Woo! How many of you have seen a sea of glass ever in his life? None. Can we talk about it? We can dream about it. We can just speculate about it the whole day. And then is how our mind get captive in heaven, in heaven conversation. And when we do that, that sense of reverence and love to our God comes naturally. But John says, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. What a beauty crystal here. Before I say something more about this, let's go to Revelation 15, 2 now. If you think that a sea of glass is amazing, see what Paul, John says now in Revelation 15, 2. And I saw, he says... I saw something like, those are the words of John. So he cannot describe it. So he was in a vision, he saw something, and then he came back and he was thinking, how 
on earth can I find a human vocabulary to describe what I saw? So he can't find it. Therefore, he says, I saw something like, it's not exactly that, but it's something like, because I haven't seen this in this earth, it's only in heaven, so he, he has to use some sort of words that he can describe what he saw in vision. He says, I saw something like a sea of glass, but this one is mingled with fire. Whew. Now this is the way we can start talking about heaven. What an amazing vision. I was checking in Google about glass and how, where glass come from. I said, well, you know, we have in our, in, our, in our houses glasses here like these beautiful ones, you know. Mr. Google said that glass is, is just melted um, sand. Is that right? So it says that the, the sand melts at 1700 degrees. 1700 degrees. That, is that right? Is that Google? If you go Google, you, you can argue with Google. It's a lot. And I was dreaming and thinking about it and say, well, the Bible even says that the, the glory of Jesus, the glory of God is, is much, much brighter and stronger than the sun in itself. So perhaps when he is there in his glory up in heaven, well, the, the sun would be able to stand the glory of God and will melt into a glass and become a glass of sea. I'm speculating here. <laughs> Would that true, be true? I don't know. But we engage in a conversation about heaven. Isn't that what Paul is inviting us here? Wouldn't that be nice that when we come to church, rather than engage in all sorts of different conversations, we engage in conversation about heaven? And then Sabbath becomes a delight. Because in there I could hear my brother Fergie sharing his thoughts about how the sea of glass would look like. And I'll get, wow, this is a nice one. And then I see Brother Tito talking about that. He said, wow. And then I leave this church after the service thinking, wow, is that how heaven will look like? And I'll be dreaming about it and wanting to be there. This is why Paul says at the end of 2 Timothy 4, 8, all who love his appearing, for the ones who love the second coming of the Lord, for us is the crown of righteousness in heaven. Let me finish 15, Revelation 15, 2. It says, Like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing of the, on the sea of glass. So John saw that the sea of glass mingled with fire is there, or something like that, not exactly like that, and then he saw a bunch of people standing on that sea of glass, having harps of God. But those people are special people, because those people love the second coming of God, want to see Jesus, want to be holy like Jesus. And these people have the victory over the beast, over the, his image, his mark, and over the number and his name. I mean, only that sentence would take us couple of sermons about who is the beast and the name and all of this. But in a summary, victory over the devil, victory over the enemy, and victorious in Jesus. Only those people. And I believe we're going to be there, right? Is that right? Are we going to be there? We're going to be there. Otherwise, what's the point of coming to church? What's the point of spending an hour or two in church every Sabbath if we're going to miss heaven? Let's keep... Active with the Bible, Matthew 16, 26. Now Jesus says something important in here that blends perfectly in the heaven conversation. That's what I said, heaven mode, all about heaven. Matthew 16, 26. Jesus say, ask in here two beautiful questions. He says, for what profit, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange of his 
soul. What is the profit if we are being coming to church every single Sabbath and at the end of the day we lose our own souls because we haven't been connected to the source of life every day. We've just been attending church. We're going to lose that. 1626 you know what nowadays the world is is very keen in in trying to sell us experience experience in in, in love in enjoyment in wonders and new thoughts and new experiences and new way of thinking and all of this but we as believers we as believers let me, let me reassure all of us here that this experience that the world is, is looking for nowadays is what God has for us in heaven. And this is the hope to where our Christian experience point. Christian hope is pointing, and listen to this, to the ceaseless ages of eternity. Our hope as believers points to the ceases, ceaseless ages of eternity where we will be able to advance in wisdom, in knowledge, and in holiness, ever exploring new fields of thought. Should I read it again? Ever exploring new fields of thought ever finding new wonders and new glories, ever increasing in capacity to know and to enjoy and to love, and knowing that there is still beyond us joy and love and wisdom infinite. This is the pointing of the Christian experience and hope. We point into that. And I believe that all of us want that. And it's given to us. And we know that when the Lord comes, He will be able to take us to the mansions that He's preparing for us so we can enjoy and live that experience forever. Why is it important that we as believers dream about the second coming? Because it's the hope that keeps us moving. The name of this church carries his identity. We are Seventh Day Adventist Church. Seventh Day because we believe that the Lord has given us the seventh day of the week, which is Saturday, which we call Sabbath, to keep it holy. Therefore, our name is Seventh Day in Adventist because we want, because we long, because we are expecting to see Jesus again. Adventist, somebody who expects the second advent of Jesus Christ. Our name as a church carries our identity. And if, if we call ourselves Adventist, Therefore, the message of the second coming of Jesus must be in our hearts and minds day and night. Because this is who we are. A movement who believes in the second coming, who wants to see Jesus sooner rather than later, and a movement who is able to share this to the rest of the world. This is why it's important that our name always remain Seventh-day Adventist because it carries our identity. It tells us what we belong to. And therefore, it's important that we preach, that we study, that we dream about the second coming of the Lord. In that sense, let me show to you a couple of verses and we'll be finishing with this. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 to 14. Notice now how Titus adds more information about the heaven conversation, the heaven mode. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 to 14. 
for the grace of God, says Titus, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Beautiful words. He says, the grace of God that brings salvation is available to everybody. But that grace of God teaches us something. That grace of God is not passive. That grace of God has the potential and the power to transform. That's why in verse 12 he says, teaching us, that grace of God that he mentioned in verse 11, teaches us, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. The grace of God teaches us to deny, to reject, to abandon ungodliness and worthy lust, to leave them, to deny them. It says, the grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worthy lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Notice, my brothers and sisters, that our calling is a high calling. We're not being called just to say, yes, I believe in Jesus and live my life totally, totally different. A life that does not show that I truly believe in Jesus and love Jesus. If we believe in Jesus, we are invited to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And who gives us the power to be able to do that? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Only by His grace, humans can be able to achieve that kind of lifestyle. The grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly, righteously, and godly in the, in, the, in the present age. Verse 13, looking. And as we live that life, we are longing, we are looking, we're expecting. It says they're looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Notice that Jesus has given himself for us, for something, to redeem us from every lawless deed. In other words, in other words, to redeem us from sin, from breaking the law, and purify for himself. His own special people. Those are the special people. They are the special people who will be standing on the sea of glass mingled with fire up in heaven. The people that is describing here. So my brothers, as we read that, we think about our calling. We think about why we are in church. And where are we heading well, I want to believe that we're all heading towards heaven. And we are all holding in the faith of Jesus and saying, Lord, help me. Give me the power that is only available in you so I can live righteously and godly in this present age, in this present world, where everything is ungodly, unrighteous, is full of worldly lust and all sorts of sin. But we as his special people do not live in that because we are being separated and cleansed and purified by the blood of Jesus. So we live differently. If we're going to live the same as the other people who do not know Jesus, and then what is the difference then? And then it says in verse 14, purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. We ought to do good works, not to be saved, but, be, but because we are saved already. Because we are saved, and then our hearts go to be obedient. Our desire is to grow in holiness in the Lord, so when He comes, we'll be able to be ready to see Him. But now the question, the one million dollar question is when he's going to come you know what our movement the seven-day adventist movement 
first as a corporate church at the beginning, right at the beginning, and then individuals, believers, ministers, elders, believers, have tried to or attempt to put a time and a date for the second coming of the Lord. Twenty times we, not we as a church, as a corporate, but as a few members. You know what, I'm not, I'm not judging them. They were so excited about the Lord that they just saw a few prophecy patterns and they thought, okay, this is the time, this is the day, this is the year. Let me, let me read to you what 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5 tells us to help us, to help us um, to be careful about dates and times. It says 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Paul says in this letter, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. What is he saying? I don't need to write anything about it, brothers. You know, because we don't know. The Bible clearly says that the only one who knows is the Father. Verse 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Verse 2 now. For you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safely, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as a labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. In other words, Paul is saying in here, brothers and sisters, we do not know about the time, and I don't need to write you about it, but I'm telling to you that his coming would be a surprise. Nobody expects somebody to break into our houses and steal our stuff. But if we know that the thief is coming, we're going to be ready, right? That's what Paul says in there, that in verse 4, For you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. If it is a surprise, nobody knows. It's a surprise because nobody knows. But it will not take us by surprise because we will be ready for it. And I like when it says in there in verse 5, You are all sons of light. And then some says that, that the Bible is the light that gives us direction. Jesus is also the light and calls us the light as well, to shine light to the world. So we are sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. In other words, we are sons of light and sons of the day because we are ready. We are not sleeping. We are ready. And then the second coming of the Lord, which is going to be a surprise, would not take us by surprise because we will be ready for it. So there's no chance that we can know when He's coming, but the invitation in here is to be ready. And how can we be ready? How can we make ourselves ready or ask the Lord to help us to be ready? Well, it says in Philippians 3.20, for our conversation is in... If our conversation is in anywhere else, I don't think we'll be ready for the second coming. I want you to remember this. We are not to live upon time excitement. All right? A seven-day Adventist, believers of Jesus and followers of Jesus Christ, we are not to live upon time excitement. But we are to live upon the event excitement. We have to live with excitement, but not upon times and dates, but upon the event in itself. So a seven-day Adventist believer lives with a lot of excitement about the second coming of the Lord, about heaven and the mansions and the beautiful place God has prepared for us over there. We are not excited about 
trying to get this prophecy, the other one, and put it together and see, well, 2020 maybe he'll come, or this place or the other place. We are invited to watch, to see the events, to study them, and get excited about the coming of the Lord, not about the time and dates of the coming of the Lord, because nobody knows them. It's good that we study the prophecies. It's good that we see the signs and the things that are going on around us. And when we see that, we get excited and say, Lord, you come in. And then we see ourselves and say, Lord, I'm ready or not? What is my conversation about every day? How do I relate to you in the church and outside the church? I'm getting ready to meet you or not? I'm going to be happy meeting you. Do I really want to see you? Do I, I'm really going to enjoy being in heaven? So those questions are personal questions that help us to get ready for the second coming of the Lord because we get excited about the event, not about times or dates. We are not to live upon time excitement. No one will be able to predict just when that time will come. And listen to this last part. You will not be able to say he will come in one, two, or five years. Should I read it again? You will not be able to say he will come in one, two, or five years. Neither are you to put off his coming by stating that it may not be for 10 or 20 years. See the point? We can't say in two or three years, and we cannot say, ah, it's going to be maybe 20, 40 years. You just relax. We need to be ready now. Talking about heaven was one way that we can start getting ready for the second coming of the Lord. And the other one is, is what I've been sharing with you before in the message about the sanctuary. In the altar of sacrifice, these two offerings that I shared with you in two previous sermons. The burnt offering, which is a total surrender to the Lord, and the sin offering, which is a confession of sin daily and asking for forgiveness daily. If we every day live that prayer of asking the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin and help us and show us what are the things that we need to confess, what are the things that the Lord needs to cleanse in our lives, and then we surrender our lives every day to Him, and then we talk about heaven, day and night, especially in heaven, in, in, in church, you'll be able to then, we'll be able then to get ready and ready and ready for the second coming of the Lord, and then He will not take us by surprise. It's my prayer as a, a member of the Church of God. It's my prayer as a minister that we all, that we all get ready for the second coming of the Lord, that we all love His second coming. How many of you would like to be in heaven? How many of us are going to get ready for the second coming of the Lord? Only by the grace and the power of God will be able to be ready for his second coming. But it's all up to us that we exercise the will that God has given us in order to search for that, in order to long for that, in order to want to be in heaven in order to enjoy that may the lord bless you today and always in our journey up to the beautiful place to the sea of glass mixed mingle with fire wherever it is that we're gonna enjoy forever god bless you let's pray heavenly father creator of this whole universe and our personal creator and redeemer and savior father we praise your name for being god for being our lovely and compassionate god and we also praise your name today for the promise of your second coming 
Lord, your second coming, the promise of your second coming gives us hope to never give up in our faith. So, Father, as a church, all of us want to tell you that we want to see you soon, Father. But we need you to teach us how to love your second coming. We need you to teach us how to dream about your, your second coming in heaven, Father. My Lord, your word has encouraged us, and we're asking that you can help us to live according to it. May you bless each one of us, those who have come to your church today. May you, Father, guide us in our journey with you. A special blessing upon Ulara Church, upon the leaders of this church, upon the minister of this church, upon all of us, Father, so we can be able to listen to your voice and be able, Father, to follow you no matter what in every single circumstances in our lives. Thank you for the second coming, the promise of the second coming, Lord. And once again, we want you to help us to get there. With your grace and mercy and power, we'll be able, Father, to make it to heaven. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.